we make our way to the United States District Court of the Southern District of West Virginia, where Judge John T. Copenhaver Jr. presides with wisdom and fairness over the case of Julie M. Wheeler. This is Julie M. Wheeler, a 43-year-old resident of Beckley, whose fraudulent actions led her to fake her own death to avoid prison. She was charged with health care fraud. Judge John T. Copenhaver Jr. of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of West Virginia found that Wheeler committed health care fraud and attempted to obstruct justice by masterminding an elaborate hoax to fake her own death and avoid sentencing. On May 31, 2020, Wheeler and her family members staged a fall from the Grandview State Park overlook, falsely reporting it to law enforcement as a fall off Grandview ledges at the New River Gorge. This deception set off an extensive search effort involving state, federal, local authorities, and numerous volunteers. Eventually, Wheeler was discovered hiding in a closet at her home by the West Virginia State Police. The court attributed Wheeler's scheme to her unwillingness to take responsibility for her crimes, leading to an enhancement in her federal sentence. Her actions' repercussions were severe, harming the justice system and depriving her sister of essential spina bifida care. During the investigation, it was revealed that Wheeler, the owner of JRW Home Care Support Services, submitted fraudulent applications to the VA Spina Bifida Health Care Benefits Program, overbilling for care services for her family member, KLKL, who suffered from spina bifida, was entitled to receive care at the VA-approved rate of $1.736 per day for eight hours of daily assistance, encompassing bathing, grooming, clothing changes, and other hygiene-related aspects of daily life. However, Wheeler failed to provide the care as stated in the claim submitted to the VA. She deceitfully stated that she cared for KL seven days a week from October 2016 to April 2018 at the full daily rate. Upon investigation, witnesses corroborate that Wheeler did not provide the stated eight hours of care daily. Mike Stewart, an attorney for the United States, had this to say about Wheeler. Absolutely despicable. Wheeler's egregious fraud scheme denied much needed spina bifida care for her own sister while she fleeced the Veterans Administration of almost $300,000. Then she faked her own disappearance to evade sentencing, risking the lives and resources of first responders and emergency personnel. Outrageous, terribly tragic case all around. Another attorney, Joshua Thompson, the prosecuting attorney for Raleigh County, emphasized the wasted efforts Wheeler has cost them. We believe that the punishment fits the crime and uh, we believe believe that um, the community can now move on from this, you know, very public uh, search and rescue that was really put in place for over a week that everyone on pins and needles in the Grandview area. In a statement to the VA and the FBI, Wheeler admitted inflating the rate and quality of care she provided to KL, defrauding the VA of hundreds of thousands of dollars and denying crucial services to the victim. Sadly, KL has since passed away, making this an even more tragic case. Judge John T. Copenhaver Jr. sentenced Julie Wheeler to 42 months in federal prison, followed by three years of supervised release and a restitution of $289,055.07, determined by the Veterans Administration. Our path leads us to the hallowed chambers of a South African court where the notorious Thabo Bester stood after being recaptured in Tanzania. This is Thabo Bester, known as the Facebook rapist, for luring victims via the social media platform. Bester's charming and manipulative demeanor helped him prey on vulnerable women. Although never convicted for one victim's rape, he was found guilty of raping and robbing two other women and murdering his girlfriend, model Numfundo Thiulu. Clinical psychologist Dr. Gerard Labushanya, who interacted with Bester in 2011, observed that he exhibited a lack of remorse and manipulative tendencies even then. The prison sentence failed to reform him, leaving his dark personality unchanged. Bester's daring escape from Mangong Correctional Center involved a meticulously planned ruse. He was believed to have died in a fire that broke out in an isolation cell, charring a body. However, subsequent investigation revealed that the charred body found was not his, and he had managed to escape disguised as a prison warder. The escape exposed severe security and official incompetence, leading to significant repercussions for those in charge. During his time on the run, Bester lived with his celebrity girlfriend, Dr. Nandifa Magudumana, who was also charged in connection with the escape. They were eventually captured in Arusha, Tanzania, after being on the run for nearly a year. Photos of the couple out grocery shopping in Johannesburg were instrumental in unraveling their secret life. The exposure of Bester's escape sparked public outrage, questioning the competence of the country's police and criminal justice system. The scandal led to changes in prison management, with G4S losing 
breaking its contract, and Bester's capture was a result of joint efforts between Interpol, private security companies, and Tanzanian authorities. As for Bester, he now faces a new trial for his escape, and Dr. Magudumana, accused of aiding and abetting him, is charged with fraud and murder. Several others involved in the escape have also been arrested. The courtroom starkly contrasted Dr. Magudumana's glamorous social media image as she appeared with shackles around her ankles, facing the charges against her. She faces charges of fraud and murder relating to three bodies she allegedly tried to claim as part of their escape plan. On the other hand, Bester seemed unfazed by the attention, displaying a dark demeanor during his brief appearance. Despite the attention from photographers, he remained unfazed, leaving observers unsettled. Clinical psychologist Dr. Labushanya reflected on the troubling reality that some offenders cannot be rehabilitated and should never be released back into society. He said, We have to accept that some people can't be rehabilitated. I don't think correctional services or society likes it, but some people are bad. However, the South African prison system does not allow for life without parole, sparking debate about the treatment of dangerous criminals and the need for re-evaluation. Bester initial sentence was life in prison for the rape and murder of his then-girlfriend, Model Numfundo Thiulu. Journeying to the Atlanta Federal Court, we find the case of Aubrey Lee Price, a minister who defrauded his victims. This is Aubrey Lee Price, who was initially a respected Christian minister and trusted financial advisor, but took a dark turn by engaging in a fraudulent scheme that devastated the lives of his clients. He was charged with bank fraud, embezzlement, and various other crimes. Price began gambling with his clients' money in 2009, making risky investments without their knowledge. To conceal his activities, he went to great lengths to falsify documents, leading his victims to believe their funds were being managed responsibly. In 2011, he convinced 40 of his clients to invest in a troubled Georgia bank, pretending that the venture would bring substantial profits. However, as the truth emerged, Price realized the bank was doomed to fail and his investors were at risk of losing significant sums. Price's journey was nothing short of remarkable, transitioning from a dedicated Christian minister and trusted financial advisor to a conniving swindler who recklessly squandered his client's life savings. To evade the consequences of his actions, actions, he took the astonishing step of faking his own death. Amid the captivating account of Price's rise and fall, it is essential to focus on the true victims of this heinous deception, those whose lives he shattered through his actions. There really isn't any justice. There's really no closure because my life is in such shambles. I'm glad he's not out there able to do it to someone else. Special Agent Ed Sutcliffe, whose expertise lies in white-collar crime, expressed profound sorrow over the devastation wrought on Price's clients. They had to learn from us that Price, their friend and advisor, was missing and all their money was gone, shared Sutcliffe during his interviews with the victims, highlighting the immense emotional toll it took on them. Price initially entered the investment business with noble intentions, aiming to fund his mission efforts overseas. His financial acumen earned him a prominent position in two well-known investment firms before he ventured out to establish his own company, PFG. In a tale of deceit, Price persuaded his clients, many of whom were personal friends and church acquaintances, to invest in a troubled Georgia bank. Concealing the true nature of the investments, he forged documents and offered false assurances. This marked the beginning of a heartless Ponzi scheme that led to immense losses for his investors and clients. By 2011, the bank's fate was sealed and Price recognized the impending financial disaster. Seeking to salvage the situation, he coerced the bank into investing millions in U.S. securities. As the Ponzi scheme expanded, he continued to deceive his investors with fabricated statements, ultimately leading to the bank's ruin and losses exceeding $70 million. With his house of cards on the verge of collapse in 2012, Price executed a shocking plan to fake his own death. He crafted elaborate suicide letters, announcing his intention to end his life dramatically by leaping off a high-speed ferry boat after it departed from Key West, Florida. Distraught by the letters, his family believed him to be dead, and a judge formally declared him so. However, FBI agents remained steadfast in their pursuit of justice. Skepticism surrounding the legitimacy of Price's death arose, particularly due to the lack of a body. After an arduous search that lasted over a year, law enforcement finally caught up with him during a routine traffic stop in Brunswick, Georgia, on that eventful New Year's Eve. Upon Price's arrest, the veil of deception lifted, exposing his double life. In possession of equipment for forging fake IDs, as well as firearms and multiple cell phones, he was implicated in drug-related activities, living a stark contrast from his former life as a respected minister and financial advisor. During interviews with Special Agent Sutcliffe, Price claimed that his risky 
investments were driven by the desire to recover his client's money, and he insisted he remained a religious individual who prayed for his victims by name every day. Yet the words fell short of the truth as his victims were left destitute, betrayed by someone they once considered a friend and confidant. In the end, a federal judge sentenced Price for his involvement in bank fraud, embezzlement, and other crimes to a substantial 30-year prison term. We make our way to the court of law situated in Jackson County and presided by Judge Kathy King Jackson, where Jacob Blair Scott, a military veteran, is found entangled in a web of sexual abuse charges in Mississippi. This is Jacob Blair Scott, who devised a desperate plan to escape the clutches of justice. He cunningly hatched a scheme to fake his own death, hoping it would shield him from the charges. He was charged with sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl and impregnating her. In a shocking twist, Scott openly admitted to orchestrating a false distress call, which prompted an extensive Coast Guard search off the Alabama coast. This treacherous act, combined with illegally transporting weapons across state lines and providing false information, left Scott entangled in a complex web of charges. As the court records bear witness, Scott's guilty plea marked a turning point in his haunting saga. Previously, he had already been sentenced to serve a lengthy prison term in Mississippi for the heinous crime of sexually assaulting a young girl, impregnating her when she was a mere 14 years old. The sinister sequence of events that led to his feigned death began to unfold in July 2018. Faced with imminent charges of assaulting the young girl, Scott orchestrated a cunning scheme. A seemingly desperate cry for help reached the Orange Beach Police Department, drawing their attention to a small boat floating adrift in the Gulf of Mexico. A chilling discovery awaited them, a firearm secured to the boat, and a heart-wrenching suicide note left behind. Authorities embarked on a relentless search for the alleged deceased, scouring the vast expanse of the Gulf for over a week. However, Scott's cunning scheme eventually came to an end. Early in 2020, he was apprehended at an RV park in Oklahoma, concealing his identity under an assumed name. The trial in Mississippi held poignant moments as the victim bravely testified, recounting the harrowing ordeal she endured at the hands of Scott. Tearfully, she revealed that he had subjected her to sexual assault on numerous occasions, over 30 times, across several months from 2016 to 2017, culminating in the discovery of her pregnancy. A chilling truth emerged that prior to his descent into darkness, Scott had served his country, earning a Purple Heart in 2011 for injuries sustained during his deployment in Iraq. His military accolades stood in stark contrast to the monstrous acts he committed, casting a haunting pall over his once heroic image. The U.S. Marshal Service, who had once held him among their 15 most wanted fugitives, now bore witness to the depths of his depravity. Before faking his own death to avoid prison, Jacob Blair Scott was sentenced to 85 years in prison. We now enter the Edinburgh Sheriff Court in Scotland for the extradition hearing of Nicholas Aliverdian, also known as Nicholas Rossi. This is Nicholas Aliverdian, a Utah rape suspect who allegedly faked his own death before fleeing to Scotland. He faces charges of identity theft and fraud and a 2008 sexual assault charge. In January 2020, Nicholas Rossi Oliverdian revealed to several media outlets that he had been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, a revelation that would soon captivate public attention. Among those he approached was the Providence Journal, to whom he insisted on reporting his illness. Later, a person claiming to be Oliverdian's widow disclosed that his ailment had spanned several months and encompassed heart disease and heart attacks. Tragically, on February 29, 2020, Oliverdian succumbed to the disease, as confirmed by both his family and his obituary. His purported widow declared that he would be cremated and his ashes scattered at sea, but she declined to provide the death certificate to the Providence Journal. Nicholas Oliverdian's presumed demise triggered an outpouring of tributes, claiming he succumbed to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2020 with his last words inspiring hope. However, officials in Utah and Rhode Island discovered the truth. Aliverdian, a convicted sex offender wanted for a 2008 rape in Utah, was alive but hospitalized in Glasgow, Scotland, grappling with COVID-19 and relying on a ventilator. Upon Aliverdian's alleged death, WPRI reported that he had emigrated from the United States four years prior, citing security concerns as the reason. Curiously, the purported widow refused to divulge their whereabouts, expressing concerns about potential threats. However, authenticity and credibility began to be questioned when, in July 2020, the Rhode Island State Police initiated an investigation into the validity of Oliverdian's death. This investigation arose from suspicions that he might still be alive, coupled with an outstanding warrant related to his family 
failure to register as a sex offender in Rhode Island, stemming from a 2008 conviction in Ohio. Doubts surrounding Oliverdian's death were voiced by individuals close to him. His former foster mother, Sharon Lane, became involved when Oliverdian's biological mother approached her to investigate the reports of his demise. She became convinced that Oliverdian had staged his death after reading adulatory comments in his obituary and memorials, which bore a striking resemblance to his writing style. Additionally, Oliverdian's former attorney, Jeffrey B. Pine, expressed skepticism about the timing of Oliverdian's illness and death, coinciding with the FBI's investigation against him. Nonetheless, the purported widow maintained that Oliverdian had indeed passed away in her presence, dismissing any suggestion of his death being a fabrication. Further questions about the validity of information emerged when the website Wikipediocracy raised concerns about the accuracy of the Wikipedia article concerning Oliverdian. Michael Cox Cochram, a member of the Wikipediocracy blog team, alleged that Oliverdian himself had edited the Wikipedia page after the supposed date of his death, attempting to alter and remove information that contradicted his reported demise. On February 1, 2021, the Providence Journal published a follow-up investigative report detailing an extensive nine-page email they had received from someone purporting to be Oliverdian's widow. The email contained rambling and often incoherent criticisms aimed at various parties, including the victim of Oliverdian's sexual offense, the police officer involved in the case, the judge overseeing it, and Oliverdian's former foster parents. Moreover, the report shed light on Father Bernard Healy's experience, a priest who had received a request for a funeral mass from a woman claiming to be Oliverdian's widow. However, State Police Detective Connor O'Donnell intervened, revealing that Oliverdian was alive, had faked his death, and was now a fugitive from justice. The complexities of Oliverdian's case extended beyond national borders. On December 13, 2021, he was arrested at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow, Scotland for an alleged rape in Utah in 2008 and other alleged crimes. Remarkably, he was receiving COVID-19 treatment under the alias Arthur Knight. Identifying him was possible through the observation of matching tattoos, though it appeared he had attempted to remove one of them. A subsequent bail hearing, held via video link, resulted in his release on bail. Unexpectedly, he left the hospital the very next day, setting off a series of events that raised eyebrows. As Oliverdian's legal saga unfolded, opinions on his identity and actions varied. Sheriff Norman McFadden of Edinburgh Sheriff Court ruled based on fingerprint, tattoo, and photographic evidence that the arrested man was indeed Nicholas Rossi Oliverdian. This decision set the stage for an extradition hearing. Meanwhile, investigations by Essex Police in England also connected Oliverdian to an alleged rape potentially complicating any potential extradition to the United States. The breakthrough in the investigation occurred when DNA evidence from languishing rape kits was entered into a national database of registered sex offenders, revealing a match with Oliverdian. His history of using multiple aliases, including Nicholas Rossi, came to light, along with previous convictions for sexual imposition and public indecency. In Glasgow, hospital staff identified the fugitive through photographs and confirmed his identity using fingerprints and DNA samples provided to Interpol. Representative Jim Langevin, Democrat of Rhode Island, expressed dismay at the abuse of the condolence citation and hope for Oliverdian's full prosecution. Every year, my office issues many condolence cards to Rhode Islanders during their times of mourning. If police reports are accurate, it is disturbing that this one was abused to further this apparent deceptive plot to escape justice. I hope he is brought to justice and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Meanwhile, the pursuit of justice for the victim spanned far beyond sexual assault cases as Oliverdian's deception inflicted suffering on many. However, Nicholas Rossi, denied all of this and maintained his innocence. 